Hello, I'm Dermot Power, and welcome to my Irish history blog. Today's story is all about the Siege of Waterford. Now, we've had many sieges of Waterford throughout our history here. You had a Confederate siege there in the 1600s. You had the siege against Cromwell in 1649. But the siege I'm going to talk about today happened in 1922. On the 6th of December 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed, and that was between the Republican forces and the English. On January the 7th, there was a vote taken in the Dáil, either to accept or reject the treaty. And it was accepted, and the vote was 64 for, 57 against. It was very, very, very close, you'll appreciate. Uh, however, it was accepted, but it was rejected by most of the IRA, the active soldiers in the field. In Waterford, on February the 8th, 1922, the Devon Regiment, which was more or less the resident British soldiers in the barracks in Waterford, vacated the barracks, and they handed it over to the York and Lancaster Regiment. And they were there for a while, and on March... The 9th, 1922, the Lancaster Regiment vacated the barracks and handed the barracks over to three IRA leaders. One was Pax Whedon from Dungarvan, the other was Mick Mansfield from County Waterford and Jerry Crone from Waterford City. So these were the three IRA men. In May 1922, Paddy Paul, who had been the officer commanding the Waterford uh, Brigade, during the Pickerton ambush in 1921. He had sided with the Free State uh, and a few other Waterford men sided with the Free State. But Paddy was a senior uh, officer in the Free State and he came to Waterford to take over the city on behalf of the Free State. And as soon as he arrived at the barracks, he was arrested by Jerry Cronin, the Waterford IRA man. And Paddy Paul went on hunger strike. He was taken to the infirmary because he was so ill at the time. Now he had spent 10 days on hunger strike, as I said, and three of those days without water. But he was recuperating up in the infirmary when one day he had a visit from some nuns from the local Sisters of Charity, two nuns in actual fact. So there was IRA guards on Paddy Paul and they were very polite to the nuns. They let him in and let him have a little bit of privacy talking. And soon afterwards, the two nuns emerged again and the guard bid him goodbye. When they went back in to check on Paddy Paul, he was gone. He had dressed up as one of the nuns and escaped, leaving a woman behind there who had come in dressed as a nun. So it's a great story and an even better escape. Have a look now at the posts. All along the quay is where the IRA was spread out. So we'll just look at a little video of along the quay and I'll point out the various places where the IRA were. But they were also up on Grey's Dew and uh, up there because the Free State forces were going to come in. They knew there was only one place to go and that was on the height of Mount Misery up there all along there by the golf links up all the whole area from Sally Park right up there. So here we go. Let's go and have a look at the video. Here we are going to look at some of the Republican uh, strongholds along the quay, starting up at the, the bridge end. So we're moving down, we can see the first one here, this stone building here, uh, is the granary, it used to be the granary, it was a corn store. Alongside of that is the Monster Express, that was another Republican stronghold. And if you can imagine, all along here, it was crowded with people as the fighting was going on. Luckily, nobody was killed. So we're moving down now to another very important one, which is more or less smack centre in the quay and another very famous Republican stronghold, indeed the birthplace of our uh, patriot Thomas Francis Marr, and that is the Granville Hotel. We're passing right here now, you can see the name. That's the Granville Hotel, another Republican stronghold. Again, all these areas here in the centre of the town, heading up towards Barnstrand Street, packed with people on the day the siege started. We're heading down now to the, the command quarters of uh, the Republicans in Waterford City, uh, headed by Jerry Cronin, and that is... The GPO, you can see it here with this beautiful red door we're passing here now. So that's the GPO, that was the main headquarters, as I said, of the Republican movement. Heading down there now again, we're going down towards Reginald's Tower. Now Reginald's Tower, we're very, very lucky to have it, as you will be learning. It was mined by the IRA 
and had, uh, except the fact that it was captured during the night, uh, they could have easily exploded the mines and we wouldn't be looking at this beautiful monument today. We'd be looking at a pile of rubble or something else. So that's the little trip around on the quay. So now two very important uh, hotels that we have to look at. Here we go, the Adelphi Hotel and at the back of it is the County Club. This is where the first Free State soldiers came and captured it. This is the front of the Adelphi Hotel. Alongside of it was uh, the Steamship Company. This is uh, the Imperial Hotel. Now the following was taken from an article that I wrote all about the Siege of Waterford for one of the local newspapers in 1995. So I'm going to have this quite detailed, so I'm going to have to read from a lot of it. Now the Siege of Waterford began on a bright Tuesday morning on July the 18th, 1922. The city awoke to the sound of Republicans making a set busy, speeding up and down the quay, and they are uh, occupying the various places all along the quay, as I've pointed out in the video. The Free State Forces had left Kilkenny. They were on their way to Waterford. They stopped in Kilmacow uh, for a break, so to speak, and they received absolution from the chaplain of the De La Salle College. They all made their confession before the attack on Waterford in case they got killed. Some of them did get killed. As I said, the Free State Forces were under the command of the Waterford man Paddy Powell and a very, very, very competent and efficient general called General Prout. So the whole place was in a state of readiness and the bridge was closed. On the Tuesday, that's the day of it, there was an armoured car speeding along the quay with the IRA lads in great humour because they knew the battle was about to start. Didn't know how it was going to go, but they knew it was going to start. They were very joyful because they had been joined by the 1st Cork Brigade, portions of it, to reinforce the Waterford IRA. There was about 300 IRA men against the Free State Forces. Many of the local lads were armed only with revolvers. So really, in reality, it wasn't going to look too good. They had also occupied, along with the places on the quay, they had occupied uh, the jail in Ballybricken. They had occupied the barracks in Barrack Street. Now, there was two barracks in Barrack Street. There was one that's presently there at the moment, and there was another one up at the top of Barrack Street uh, in a place called Cartridges Avenue. That was the cavalry barracks. So all those were occupied by the Republicans. But really, the lads on the quay were the only ones who were really going to engage in the battle. And uh, sniping and so forth from the positions along the quay. So, let's start with the siege. On the day of the siege, on the Tuesday, the GPO was taken over uh, and fortified by the Republicans. About 6.30pm in the evening, a small advance party of Free Staters was spotted on the brow of the hill at Sally Park. The presence was acknowledged by the Republicans who found a sustained burst from a Thompson and loose machine gun from the positions in the two barracks and the jail and Bilberry Rock. As I said, some of the IRA had gone up there, Bilberry. As a result of this gunfire, the Siege of Waterford claimed its first victim, a Free State volunteer named Costello, who was one of the Free State scouting party. Now, the scouting party comprised of about six men who, when fired upon, died for cover. One man was seen to fall. This was a volunteer Costello. He was rescued by Captain Edward O'Brien, that's Ned O'Brien, I'll be telling you a lot more about him later on, and Sergeant Murphy, who were up and rating with the Free State Forces. However, Volunteer Costello was shot through the lung, fell seriously wounded, and died of his wounds on the Thursday morning. Now, the Free State Forces posted on Mount Misery, as it's called, returned fire. The quay was packed with onlookers, but they didn't seem to panic and rather seemed to enjoy the spectacle. At 5 a.m. on the Wednesday morning, the stillness of the morning was broken by the sound of machine guns as they rattled out from the Republican positions in the jail. Sometimes later, the Free State was seen bringing the 18-pounder gun along the golf links and into position on the rock overlooking the town. This operation was greatly hampered by the devastating fire from the Republican positions. At last, however, the field gun was made ready at about 10.40 a.m. in the morning 
and it opened fire. And the first thing it hit was Paddy Paul's mother's house in Barrick Street. Blew the chimney off it. Very soon they had a range anyway and they opened up some devastating fire. As I said many houses in Barrick Street were destroyed and their occupants evacuated as indeed did many in the vicinity of the jail. Now Tramore was the principal refuge for an awful lot of Waterford City people and uh, I remember my mother telling me that during the siege of Waterford her mother brought her out to uh, out around the Skibbereen area and that's where they stayed. In Barry Street off to the infantry barracks another shell blew a large hole in a house, house owned by a Mrs Nolan and as I said Paddy Paul's mother house also suffered with the chimney being blown off it. Two shells landed at the ground of the Ursuline Convent but did not uh, do any damage. On Wednesday afternoon, the terrified residents of the Little Sisters of the Poor that was up in Bunkers Hill left their residence and walked in procession out to the Ursuline Convent where they remained up in the siege had ended. On Wednesday afternoon, machine gun and rifle fire was resumed on an intensified scale, resulting in some fatalities. William Long of Bat Street was shot through the brain in the vicinity of the cathedral down in Barron Strand Street. He was moved up to St Patrick's Hospital but he was found to be dead on arrival. Later in the day, Joseph Dwan, a native of Port Darlington, was shot at the top of Olive Street. Shot dead, actually. That was close to the Franciscan Friary. About 5pm on Wednesday evening, the shelling resumed with great intensity and continued on about 9pm. This fire was directed mainly at the infantry and artillery barracks, IRA strongholds. The Republicans in the infantry barracks were forced to flee their position and in doing so set the barrack alight. At about 11pm, the artillery barracks was evacuated by the Republicans and again they put the barracks to the torch. The flames from these fires could be seen from miles around and such was the density of the smoke that it was only with great difficulty that one could negotiate the streets in this area. The visibility had been reduced by several feet. After the withdrawal of the Republicans from both barracks, crowds rushed in and began to loot the barracks. A mine in the infantry barracks exploded with intense heat which resulted in four casualties. This had the effect of stopping the looting which ended around midnight. While heavy shells were directed against both barracks in the jail, small arms, machine gun fire and rifle fire was directed by the Free State forces upon the Republican defences along the quay. Such was the intensity of this gunfire that it was impossible to pass any of the roads leading to the quay, especially Kaiser Street, Barnstrand Street, Gladstone Street and Hanover Street. With the fall of darkness on Wednesday night, a body of Free State troops under the command of Captain Mackey, a clan mailman, crossed the river by boats to the waterside. side. This was apparently anticipated by the Republican forces who set out to intercept them. Uh, however, Captain Mackey avoided the main road and instead worked his way along the riverbank. At midnight, they halted for about an hour and again started off. About quarter to two in the morning, they reached the house about 100 yards at the rear of the county club. As I said, that's at the back of the present uh, Tower Hotel, where they posted a machine gun to cover the principal windows of the Adelphi Hotel. While a bombing party under the command of Captain O'Brien, that's the local lad Ned O'Brien, advanced towards the county club with orders to storm the positions if necessary. But they needn't have been too concerned because when they got in, there was no need for storming because all the Republicans were fast asleep. Ha boo babby wanting. At the gain and entry, the Free State captured the Adelphi garrison in the same madness. A similar tactic was used in the capture of the garrison in the Clyde shipping. That was uh, a building between the Adelphi Hotel and the Imperial Hotel. The Imperial Hotel had the, were flying the Red Cross, Cross flag since the beginning of the siege. However, it was claimed that a duplicate of all the book was found buried in the heading column headquarters. But was it a hospital or was it the headquarters? Who knows? When the Free State troops gained entry to the Imperial Hotel, a number of people were found wearing Red Cross armbands. Having security at Delphi, end of the key, the Free State advanced towards Reginald's Tower. However, the Republicans had vacated Reginald's Tower, leaving behind them some arms and ammunition which included three mines which had been sunk outside Reginald's Tower and connected by wire to a position in the Adelphi Hotel. Now, I shudder to think of the consequences had these mines gone off 
because in having, instead of having our beautiful originals to her, we'd be probably looking at a block of flats or something there, or a pile of rubble. On Thursday, July the 20th, the Republican forces still held out at the GPO, the Granville Hotel, the jail and some sniping posts along the quay. At 11.30am, the Republican garrisons were given absolution by some water for priests. The Free State troops advanced cautiously towards the GPO, this being necessary because of the open ground around the GPO. At one point, a small party of Free State troops got within 20 yards of the GPO but were driven back by the intensity of gunfire directed at them by the Republican defenders. Having not only to contend with a frontal attack from Free State forces on the quay, the GPO Republicans also had to contend with intense fire from the Free State forces station in the flour mills, recently knocked down, and some sheds in that vicinity. Republican fire was returned from positions in the jail and sniping posts in Thomas Hill, Ballybricken and posts along the quay. Between 4 and 5 p.m. the 18 pounder gun was brought down from Mount Misery and positioned on the railway line. This manoeuvre uh, was answered by a hail of bullets from the Republican positions. Such was the intensity that the gun crew dived for cover as bullets ricocheted off the gun carriage. The Republican fire then seized as they had mistakenly believed that the field gun position had been knocked out. However, a gun crew under Gunner Cavania lay on the ground and got a line on the post office. They then brought the gun field gun into action. Six shells struck the, the building, that's the GPO, one or two piercing the solid masonry and exploding inside. The Republican defenders were forced to vacate the upper floor of the GPO and to take cover on the ground floor. One of the GPO defenders was a Waterford City man, John Bonnie Dial was his nickname, and he was wounded in this engagement and was to die of his wounds some days later on August the 4th. The Republican force then abandoned the GPO. Some fleeing to the Granville Hotel, another Republican stronghold, and uh, uh, another couple of shops up in Barnstrand Street they also occupied. The Free State troops then proceeded along the quay to their next target, the Granville Hotel. However, after a barrage of fire having been directed against them, the Republicans were forced to flee this position. A number of Republican forces were captured, 18 in all. Amongst them was the commander of the Republican forces in Waterford, Commandant Jerry Cronin, who had fought alongside Paddy Paul at the Pickerstown ambush. At the Granville Hotel, a mine was discovered attached to an electric battery and was defused. Several hand grenades were also found. After the capture of the Granville Hotel and other places along the quay, operations were suspended for the night. Silence reigned, except for some sniping from Republican positions. On Friday morning, July the 21st, uh, the only substantial Republican position was the jail on Ballybricken. Other positions held out were some houses on Ballybricken and Barrick Street, along with a few on the quay. In the afternoon, the Free Strait troops brought the heavy 18-pounder gun into position on the Ferrybank railway line. This given a very good line of fire for the jail. As they were doing so, the Republicans in the jail opened up a barrage of fire at the 18-pounder. The gun crew were forced to take shelter behind the shield to protect the crew and to allow it to manoeuvre into position. A Lancia car, that's an armour car, drew up in front of them on the railway bridge. And a young Free State soldier named Howlett from Duncannon County, Wexford, mounted a Lewis gun in the car and returned fire, despite the heavy fire coming from the Republican positions. Alas, the young lad's bravery was not enough to protect him, and finally he was struck in the eye with a bullet that pierced his brain, killing him instantly. With the 18 pounder gun now in position, the crew opened up a deadly effect on the jail. Dense clouds of smoke and dust rose into the air as the shells landed in the centre of the prison. Five shells in all landed in the jail, but the second shell had the desired effect and the Republicans fled the scene via Chapel A, leading to Ballybricken Church. No sooner had the Republicans left the jail when a large number of the locals on Ballybricken and the surrounding lanes into the jail despite the gunfire and shells firing all around and they looted the place. Uh, an old woman told me that she remembers she was only a young man and was over there on Ballybrick and looking at the scene 
And next thing she got the fright of her life when she saw this table apparently moving on its own and heading across Ballybricken. Four or five fellas had went into the jail, a huge big long table they had gotten underneath, on, supporting her with their, with their backs and stood up and off it went and it looked like the table was moving of its own volition. Having worked their way along the quay, the Free State troops attempted to lower the bridge which had remained up throughout the siege and in, which in fact prolonged the siege because the Free State troops couldn't get across. They tried to lower the bridge but the Republicans had dismantled part of it. They eventually got it down and the troops went, uh, the Free State troops got over the bridge. By 9pm that evening, there was a, as they were, when they got across the bridge, they all held their guns up in the air, the Free State troops, and they fired a long volley in celebration of getting into Waterford City. The remaining Free State troops now entered the city and established their headquarters at the Imperial Hotel, present Tower Hotel. The siege of Waterford had now effectively ended. Amazingly, despite the heavy shelling and intense fire, the siege of water resulted in casualties, but not as many casualties as probably could have happened. Although the siege of water had ended, had ended the War of Brothers did not end until May 1923. Saturday, July the 22nd, saw a resumption of business, normal business all around. Many of the Republicans were interned in jail. Some Kilkenny jail, some in Ballybricken jail. But getting back to Ned O'Brien, a young man, and you have to admire him. He was a Free State soldier. He was only 21 when he was killed. Because of his bravery during the Siege of Waterford, he was promoted to a commandant. And in August of 1922, there was a bit of a commotion on Barrack Street, and he came out of the barracks on Barry Street and with another soldier and went down to see what the commotion was and he was shot and killed. To the best of my knowledge and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong I think he's buried out close to the Republican plot out in Ballygunner. He's not in the Republican plot and probably that's the way it should be because they fought for different ideals. The Republicans fought for a 32 county republic now, I don't know, was a 32-county republic ever achievable? Perhaps it was. Collins didn't think so. De Valera, I'm not convinced that De Valera thought that a 32-county republic was achievable either. Uh, however, you know, in the 26th county, the legacy of the treaty is that we were a 26-county unit that on, got on reasonably well after a long, long time of poverty. However, in the north of Ireland, the legacy of the treaty is you had a nationalist population up there who were oppressed because of their religion, because of their nationality. They got the worst jobs, they got the worst housing. And remember, the troubles in the north didn't start because of anything over the nationalists looking for human rights is all they were looking for. They were looking for a decent house, a decent job to be respected for their religion. And that was the legacy of the treaty for those people. But to finish with a humorous story, when I was doing my book in 1992, I was researching uh, Waterford songs. And I'd like to respect both sides of the argument of the treaty. I spoke to an old Republican friend of mine, an old man at that time. And I said to him, Michael, I said, did you ever hear I said a Free State song. I said I'm after getting hundreds of Republican songs but I can't find a Free State song. And he turned to me and looked at me with a very serious face and said maybe they had not to sing about by. That's the way he felt. Well I do hope you enjoyed the little talk on uh, our tragic civil war and indeed it was tragic and should never be forgotten. And again as I say there were two sides to it uh, and you know, I think it should always remain. We should always respect the people on both sides for the positions they took. Don't lump them together. That is to invalidate either side's argument. To say to a, 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 a Republican, a man who's buried uh, out in Ballygunner or 
whose memorial is in some lane like John O'Rourke up by the Holy Cross who was killed in, I think in 1921. Those men who were killed out in Pickardstown, they fought for a 32 county Ireland. The Free State lads believed that this is our chance, as Colin said. It's a stepping stone. We must respect that. Respect them all, but respect them individually and separately. I do hope you enjoyed that little story of the Irish Civil War. And if I may, I'd like to conclude by telling you a story of my own family and their connection with that Civil War. My granduncle was a founding member of the Irish Republican Army in Waterford City here. During the War of Independence and indeed during the Civil War, he was quartermaster in the Irish Republican Army. At the Civil War, at the treaty, he sided with the anti-treaty side. That means he fought and wanted to continue to fight for a 32-county republic. The Free State wanted to accept a 26-county and allow six counties to remain connected to England. They saw it as a stepping stone to freedom. However, my granduncle didn't see it that way and continued. He was arrested around the end of 18, 1922 and was incarcerated in Ballybrick and Jail here in Waterford City. While he was in jail, his youngest child died, who was called after him. His name was John. And he wasn't allowed out on compassionate leave, probably because he was a quartermaster and knew where the guns were hidden. So they brought the cortege all along over Ballybricken, which is just adjacent to the jail, and they brought him up to an office that he could look out over Ballybricken Green and see the funeral of his youngest son being brought past while he was there. I was told by an old Republican that he was the last Republican prisoner to be freed from Ballybricken Jail. That was uh, around the end of August 1922. Uh, it is said that the torch of freedom burns bright in the hearts of many young men. And I think in my granduncle, it burned bright, that torch of freedom burned bright well into old age. And just to give you a story to illustrate that. Uh, in the 1980s, I was talking to a very well-known uh, Republican, probably an IRA man, and told me that when they were looking for guns for the provisional IRA in the early 70s, because of that particular period, the Catholics were really getting it hot and heavy in the north of Ireland between the British Army, between internment, Bloody Sunday, and attacks on Catholic homes. So they were looking for guns. His own father, this Republican figure, would have been a senior officer in the IRA in the War of Independence and in the Civil War. So they approached my granduncle and asked if he had guns, and he did. I had this confirmed by one of his children. They got some guns and gave them to this gentleman, and they made their way to the north of Ireland, as he thought and believed, to further the fight for freedom. Just an interesting little snippet. Uh, from my family history. Again, I do hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, just subscribe and leave a comment. Thank you very much until the next time. Over the building the tricolour flies It's soft falls kissing the summer skies The doors are barred and the sandbags lay Whilst few and short are the words that are said Over the city the rifles crack While mountain miseries hide re-echoes back Thus we wait for the evening's glow For the fight to begin in the GPO